Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 112. As always, it is one of my favorite things to do in life is to sit down with a naturopathic physician. And today, boy, oh boy, do I have a treat for you. We have with us Dr. Beverly Yates, who is a naturopathic physician with an amazing background, and her focus is helping us end the blood sugar madness, end this diabetes insanity, which is out of control, not only in North America, but other countries are showing diabetes is just absolutely out of control. In India, I've heard that it is one of the the most common uh, illnesses as well. And so worldwide, and I do have an, a great international following. Worldwide, this is becoming such a huge issue. And, and uh, pharmaceutical medicine, uh, allopathic medicine is not working. What they're doing, they're creating more drugs, they're selling more drugs, and the problem's getting worse and worse. So today, Dr. Beverly Yates is here to share with us what we can do to get our blood sugar under control and end this madness. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much. What a warm welcome. I appreciate being here. Yes, I would love for you to start by sharing your background because you have this wonderful background. <laughs> and, and and what led you to be uh, the wonderful naturopath that you are today? Well, you know, it's an unusual journey, that's for sure. But life is full of those moments where you just have to make a decision. So how I went from electrical engineering to naturopathic physician is that I got sick personally. And I really enjoyed my work as electrical engineer. I've always loved math and science and I like the practical applications of stuff, you know? I had a ham radio license as a child. Yes, I was one of those kids. <laughs> and when I moved from California, from Silicon Valley, working as an engineer to Oregon, I found out the Pacific Northwest was quite moldy because really it's a temperate rainforest. There was just a lot of rain, a lot of moisture, and I'm sensitive to mold. And I got sick. And for the first time in my life, I felt really fatigued and I had brain fog and I just was not feeling well. And I was in my early 20s at that point, a time in life when you should be feeling fabulous. And I sought out all kinds of help. And for about a year, I saw a medical doctor. I got allergy sensitization shots to try to help with the mold problem. I had never heard at that time of naturopathic medicine. And then about a year in, my husband told me about a person that he worked with uh, he too worked in high tech, who was seeing a naturopathic physician and getting really great results with his particular allergy problems. And I thought, oh, well, maybe this can help me because you know what, Ashley, I'm always all about the results. I want to do what works, whatever we call it. I want to do what works. So I went to see this naturopathic physician and he, for one thing, he looked me in the eye. He listened and we had about an hour initial appointment. At the end of that, he gave me some biofeedback to do and some homeopathic remedies, two in particular with very specific instructions. And in the course of a month, I was dramatically better. And I was able to sustain that benefit. And I have to tell you, those results really got my attention. I thought to myself, man, why have I never heard of this kind of medicine before? This is like some kind of best kept secret, but you know, it's time to shine a light on it. And so I'm grateful for that moment that I had a chance to make a different choice and I chose to do it and it worked out so well for me. So that got my attention and eventually led to a career choice, you know? So people often have a brain disconnect. They're like, how could you be an MIT electrical engineer and then be a naturopathic physician? Like what in the world connects those two? And I tell people, look, it's about solving problems. If you're an engineer, what do you do all day, every day? You solve problems. And if you're a doctor, if you're a doctor who cares, if you're a doctor who wants to get results for people, if you really want your folks to be better, your patients to be better, then you want results. And I wanted a much bigger toolbox than what I saw was true for Western conventional allopathic medicine. I wanted to have more than simply drugs and surgery to offer people. And as we look at what's happened with national health and international health trends, particularly with respect to diabetes and prediabetes, we know that much of the changes that will need to happen, the habit changes has to come from the realm of lifestyle from nutrition, from exercise and movement, sleep, stress, and all those other things that impact our health and wellness, and in particular, our blood sugar control. Now, before we get into blood sugar, and I'm really excited to do so, I, I'm so curious. So you went to MIT, and uh, you received your Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, 
And then, you know, later on, like you shared, you went to um, the wonderful National College of Naturopathic Medicine, now the National University of Naturopathic Medicine in uh, Portland, Oregon, a wonder yes. wonderful school. Um, can you share with us? So you've been a student at these two very different institutions. What was it like? being a student uh, of naturopathic medicine versus uh, being a student at MIT? <clears throat> One of the things that was different was, like at MIT, obviously it's all about the science and the math and the technology and things related to it, and very much an internationally renowned research institution. One key difference I noticed between there and my naturopathic medical school education was that we had much more permission to show ourselves as people. There was much more of an opportunity to be heart-centered. So naturopathic medicine absolutely has its research umbrellas and areas where that work is done. And one of the things that we do clinically is pull forward our experience with patients directly. So rather than waiting to the very end of the medical school cycle, you know, from the beginning, from the first year, there's a, a chance to interact with the public and to find out, you know, is this for me? Can I actually look someone in the eye and give them bad news, let's say, with a diagnosis? Or sit with someone who's really upset and maybe having a hard time with whatever it might be, because, you know, if you haven't done your own emotional work, it's just hard to actually be focused on somebody else in that moment, right? Medicine is not always happy or easy. And that's just as true of naturopathic medicine as it is conventional medicine. There are difficult moments. And I appreciated that we could do our gut checks and our emotional spiritual checks around that much earlier in a process than is the case for a conventional medical school. At MIT, you could be all about your brain. You could be the brainiac that you are. You know, if you're totally a nerd, that's the place for you. But it wasn't necessarily a place where I felt that there was much room for compassion and spiritual expression. Now, that's not to say that there aren't people there who are compassionate. There most certainly are. And that's not to say that there's no spirituality. There are definitely spiritual communities in MIT. But there was way more permission in the world of naturopathic medicine for that. I love it. I love that that... Um at its core, it's holistic, you know, it's allowing you to be a, a person, not, not just a student, it's allowing you to see you uh, as, as you as a whole, um, which I think is wonderful because that is, that is uh, the core of naturopathic medicine is looking at the body holistically instead of breaking it up and um, uh, treating its parts, you're treating the whole. I would love for you to share with us why have you decided to um, – become this wonderful expert about helping people resolve blood sugar. Uh, what drew you to want to help solve this problem? Well, it's for a personal reason. I've had quite a number of family members, in particular on my father's side of my family, who have been directly affected by diabetes, primarily type 2 diabetes and uh, pre-diabetes, and I believe one person with type 1 diabetes. And it has had such a profound effect in folks' health and wellness as they aged and has cut lives short. And it's just really clear to me that if you can know what to do and can actually do it and you can make the appropriate habit changes to get good results and get blood sugar back into a healthy range and keep it there, that you're much, much more likely to avoid the serious potential consequences of these kinds of problems uh, and live a much better quality of life. You know, for me, it was it was a personal journey as I came to understand how much my family was being impacted by prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. And so I began to care because as I was getting older, I realized, oh, wait a minute, this might be on my event horizon if I don't do something. <laughs> you know, I can't necessarily um, eat what I see everyone around me eating or decide, oh, I'd rather sit on my butt and not move or not exercise because then I set myself up for something that apparently our family is quite vulnerable for. I love that you mentioned that I can't eat like everyone else eating is eating. I think it's really important. It's something I learned when I studied um, neurolinguistic programming is that if you if you want uh, to be a statistic, then follow the herd mentality. <laughs> and so if you want look at the greatest statistics, you know, number one killer heart disease. And, and, and of course, um, blood out of control blood sugar can lead to heart disease. Um, and out of control blood sugar is now like one in three people have uh, prediabetes. I mean, it's just and then, of course, obesity is on the rise and. Uh, something like only 3% of our healthcare dollars is being spent on preventive medicine. So you just yeah. look, you look at all these statistics and if you want to be a statistic, just do what everyone else is doing, eat what everyone else is eating and, and you're sure enough to get it. That's just, you know, like, <laughs> it's like a, going to a casino. <laughs> Here's your odds. Uh, but we have to, <laughs> we have to swim upstream. We have to go against 
the herd. And yeah. it, 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 and I love the nature paths are here to support us not only physically, but emotionally and mentally, because I think it's difficult when you need to turn around and go, you know what? I am, I'm no longer, I'm going to no longer be a diabetic. I'm going to shift my lifestyle. I'm going to take the right supplements. I'm going to eat the right food. I'm going to do everything. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to stress management. I'm going to do everything it takes to turn my health around. Now, all of a sudden you're going up against the belief system of your friends and family and so it, it's more than just the changes you need to make. It's also a support system you need to create and, and, and healthy emotional boundaries you need to set up with those around you um, who may not uh, yet understand. They may not be awake enough or understand what you're up to. And so uh, how do you help? Uh, what? How can we help those who really want to make a change but don't really know how to set up their external environment, their community to support them? The, that's an excellent question, actually. An excellent question. You know, the support system, the emotional ecosystem, if you will, the spiritual beliefs, the habits of the people around folks who have diabetes and prediabetes are really important. Change is hard enough if you're trying to do it for yourself or in isolation. If you're doing this in a community, you have to have helpful, supportive people around you. In fact, it's one of the reasons why I'm shifting my practice to online work, because I can just be helpful to more people around the lifestyle aspects. You know, when I think about diabetes and the shifts and the changes that you've just mentioned and the support system, I cannot tell you how many times people have come to me over the years or when I've been doing speaking out in the community or at conferences, et cetera, invariably at least three to four, sometimes a dozen or more people come up and say, how do I help my family understand it's not a loving, kind thing to give my diabetic mother or my diabetic grandfather, you know, three slices of cake? And then they're surprised when they're in the hospital the next day with the reactions to what was for them essentially a blood sugar shock, right? Mm -hmm. You know, or how do I get my kids to understand that, you know, if they don't chill out with the amount of candy that they consume or just stop altogether or, you know, no more liquid sugar like sodas, that they're going to wind up a diabetic like everybody else in the family and on and on. And people are always asking for how do I, right? and basically make this habit change. So I found that there's two kinds of folks when it comes to this. The first kind, which is rare, by the way, it's about 4% of the population anywhere in the world. About 4% of us by personality type can make an abrupt change quickly. So those are the people that can go whole hog on whatever it is. And if you tell them to do 12 things, they'll get all 12 done immediately. That's my father-in-law. He uh, decided one day to quit. So he was like a pack a day, no filter. <laughs> and just decided because he was also a cyclist and he go and the, ah. you know, this is back like right the 60s 70s like everyone yeah. smoked and everyone you know <laughs> and he there's like pictures of people cycling like and smoking at the same time yeah. and he uh he just said you know this isn't this is interfering with my with my cycling and he quit just cold turkey never looked back same with drinking i mean you know he wasn't like an alcoholic but everyone everyone like drank and then he yeah. just decided one day I'm not going to drink anymore. Never touched a, a, a drop of alcohol again. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I, I thought that was amazing because I don't know anyone else in the world who can just go from a pack a day, <laughs> no filter smoking to not at all. Uh, that, that That is definitely a, a small percentage of us. So for the rest yeah. of us who need some additional support, what do we do? So for the rest of us, the vast majority, right? So people like we just talked about, that's one out of 25 folks. For the other 24 out of 25, <laughs> the thing you do is you make incremental progress. You get small wins and you build momentum. Small changes over time have a tremendous impact. And so instead of, you know, shaking your finger at your patient because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing or shaking your finger at their family because it looks like they're sabotaging that person's efforts to change, instead we celebrate whatever progress they make. Mm. So I can give you some very practical examples. For instance, when I first started practicing, what I would do is I would have people change one meal and make a commitment to change one meal out of the three that they ate a day. And so they might decide that they could manage breakfast. That would be their healthful meal for the day. Other people felt they could take on dinner. Some people it was lunch, but whatever it was, and I would outline for them what it was that made that a successful meal, you know? So we'd start there and then we could branch out to the others because it became a little easier for them. And invariably though, all right, Ashley, check it out. Here's where the wheels come off the cart, okay? For everybody, and this is social settings, especially parties and traveling. Not even necessarily business settings, but social settings like parties 
and then traveling. Like, what do you do when you're stuck on an airplane and you're on the tarmac for like six hours and they can't take the carts out to bring you any food, right? You're getting crabby because you're hungry, your blood sugar's crashing, et cetera, you know? And so helping people walk through and work through those moments meant they felt like they had a plan. Now we have all kinds of options. We've got meal planning that's available for people at very reasonable prices, other options. So when it comes to habit change, I find small changes gradually. So some people can think about a particular meal. Other people will think about a category of food. And I always have people increase things before I take anything away. So for instance, I might have people focus on increasing dark leafy greens because those are rarely the source of allergies. In fact, I've never had a patient who had an allergy to a dark leafy green. And they're also an awesome partner with getting that blood sugar to improve quickly. It's just such a good thing all the way around, even for travelers, like send people to a salad bar, have them go and get washed and prepped greens. All they have to do is open up the bag and enjoy them. I mean, it's gotten a lot more convenient than say it was 20, 30 years ago to do this. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I love that. I love that idea also of you're adding before you're taking away the concept yes. of crowding out. You know, if they fill the yep. plate with with the good stuff, then it's easy. It's just it just sort of crowds out the bad stuff. And and, <laughs> and the fact is, a uh, 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 five hundred calories of uh, broccoli would make you feel like you just ate uh, Thanksgiving dinner. So. <laughs> You can you can fill that plate with all the wonderful, delicious. And another thing about vegetables, I just have to point out, is that it's sort of like um, you're you're shifting your 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 taste buds because if you're used to MSG laden foods, uh, you're used to a certain stimulus, and uh, yeah. and then it's like going from from listening crazy music to listening to classical. You know, the first the first few days you're kind of like this is boring, and then all of a sudden you grow an appreciation for it. Same with with vegetables. If you if you eat vegetables with nothing maybe maybe a little bit of butter and salt who knows but but if you just eat vegetables the way they are and 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 start to ask your ask yourself to find the flavors in it and and chew mm -hmm. and chew and chew and, and and pretend pretend like you're almost like wine tasting you begin to find all these subtle notes there's thousands of different flavors that come out uh, because of all the different phytonutrients and chemicals in uh in vegetables they they cannot um reproduce the amount of flavors that are in natural vegetables in artificial foods i actually interviewed a a, a food chemist and she says that they add about 15 to 25 artificial flavors into, you know, chips, for example, corn chips or something like Doritos. But when she said, when it comes to vegetables, because of all the complex chemicals, there's these hundreds and hundreds of different uh, flavors that you could be experiencing from all these different chemicals. So the, the flavor profile of vegetables is so much more complex and delicious if you give it a chance. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And you know what else shifts with that? Of course you wanna shift people's taste buds and preferences, right, their palate, what they're used to eating, the salt, the sweet, you know, the uh, the the fatty mouthfeel, if you will, of a lot of foods, mm -hmm. particularly prepared foods. The other thing that's gonna shift as you go towards the healthier foods, the stuff that you have to actually chew and it, and it takes a little work, you know, to actually get it in you, is gonna be your gut bacteria, your microflora in your large intestine and your small intestine, you know, your microbiome shifts too. And in fact, you know, you might, and we don't want to get off topic here, but, you know, I'm sure you'll have other guests who have this expertise as well. It's fascinating to me, as we do all this research on the biome for the human uh, gut, and we look at the biome of other creatures, and how if you take, for instance, the fecal material, the stool, and I know some people will be repelled by what I just said, but it's true. If you take that fecal material from a lean creature and put it in an obese creature, the obese creature becomes lean. And the exact opposite is true. If you take the fecal material, the stool, from an obese creature and put it into a lean creature, the lean creature becomes obese. Now, if that isn't a clue around the signaling and how intricate all this stuff is, that's amazing to me. Absolutely. So if you have more of those dark leafy greens and they nourish naturally that leaner microbiome, right, because the bacteria shift in response to what we eat, of course, then what a simple way to help yourself. I mean, you're getting help directly because you're lowering your blood sugar. All that fiber is fabulous for your blood sugar. The nutrients you just talked about that can help the vegetables to actually taste good if we give them a chance also help all those phytonutrients, your blood sugar, and 
you might be giving enough good feedback to healthy bacteria in your gut and encouraging them because they're getting their goodness too, that they start to help you with weight management becomes less of a struggle. But it's hard to get those first couple of steps going because look, a lot of people like really gummy, easy to eat food. It's kind of like adult baby food. It has no fiber. <laughs> Adult you know? baby food. I'm just imagining all the gluten lovers out there that love their yeah. their uh, that 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 mouthfeel that you said. <laughs> like they're if we thought about this as adult baby food, I mean, people would like their, their pride would be cold, wouldn't it? <laughs> but it's true. If you don't have to chew, if you can just slide it down and be done in ten minutes, that's probably not a good meal. You need to be able to actually chew it. It will slow you down. Mm. No chewing, you're not on the right path. <laughs> I love this. I love that we're getting into the solution already. I want to go back to the problem and just, I'd like yeah. to understand it a bit more. I mean, I understand, I know my listeners understand the problem from the mainstream perspective, you know, mm -hmm. diabetes out of control, everyone should get blood tests so that we can put them on medication, right? Right. Um, so from a naturopathic standpoint, especially your standpoint, because uh, you are so scientific and uh, you, you are uh, solution-based uh, and root cause-based, why is this such a problem now? Why in the last hundred years is blood sugar out of control? What a fabulous question. Okay, listen, I've thought about this deeply and long. Here's my take on it. The last hundred years has seen some profound shifts in how we as humans behave. And our behavior and our habits are completely intertwined. And right now, most of us have very sedentary lives. We sit on our butts. We do not have a reason to do heavy work throughout our day on a regular basis. We just don't. We got gizmos, we've got technology, we've got appliances, we've got transportation vehicles, we've got all kinds of things that keep us from needing to move. We even have remote controls. We don't even have to get up and change the TV channel. I mean, if you look at people's pictures in their own family, and in fact, everyone listening to the podcast, I invite you, look at pictures of your own family. Look at pictures of other people's family from 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, and if you can go back far enough, 100 years ago. You can't help but notice, not only are we getting taller, we're getting wider, as in we're heavier, we weigh more. Regardless of our heritage, we are all getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And there comes a point where this added weight is actually against a good sort of you know trajectory for human development. We've got to do something to rein this in. Now, some of it is increased calories for sure and easy access to calories without having to do the work to get them. Back in the day, 100 years, 200 years, 300 years ago, more people were in a farm or agricultural setting. They were more likely to do their own labor. They washed their own clothes. They probably made their own clothes. They made their own furniture and homes. You know, life was very, very different. And the food that they ate was often the food that they grew themselves or was in their community. We have such a different relationship now to food, to flavors, to tastes. Even if you look at television advertising, let's say in the 50s and 60s, to say now in the 2010s, 2020s, wow, what a difference. There's so many more ads for food. You're constantly being provoked and messaged to go and get food. Drive down the street, go along on a highway. What do you see? Billboards for food. You're on the internet, maybe you're on YouTube. What are the ads that are constantly served? Food. It, you cannot get away from it. And so, you know, I think not only are we trying to ask people to have a level of discipline that is inhuman, we're also setting up the problem because now we're saying that this is normal to have this kind of an obsession with food. So I think part of the root cause of the problem is one, our physical self is not given enough opportunity to really work. So that's why so many people, if they don't belong to a, a gym or a health club or work, uh, excuse me, go and exercise out of doors, wherever they live, or maybe like me, you know, as I've been working more in my online business, I have a, a um, walking treadmill right here in the office because I was finding that I was going, starting to be entirely too sedentary too. And, you know, with all the problems that can go with that, and I know better, it's called the sitting disease, right? So this is real. This is a root cause. We don't have anywhere near as much need to exercise and to move throughout our day. So if we don't build that in and say, okay, I'm going to take an hour to get my workout in, maybe I'm going to do resistance training, Maybe I'm going to do interval training. Maybe I'm going to do HIIT, high intensity interval training. Whatever it is that makes sense for my particular body type, because different people respond to different things. But if we don't make that, you know, promise to ourselves that we're going to get that done, oh, here come the pounds. 
And I think it's more than just the changes in hormones as we age, because again, look at your family pictures from 30, 50, 70, 100 years ago. Everybody had hormonal changes. Women didn't just start going through menopause. Men didn't just start going through andropause. So don't tell me it's just a hormonal change. That's one piece. The other side is environmentally, there's a lot more chemicals that we're exposed to, and they may well have interactions with hormones, including insulin. And I want everybody to be crystal clear, insulin is a hormone. So the chemicals that are we're being exposed to is like is disrupting our hormones. There is some really clear evidence around that. And some of the chemicals are thought to be either obesogenic in the sense that it makes it much more easy for our bodies to put on weight and to drag people towards obesity and to morbid obesity, or some of these chemicals that are in the environment that have adverse effects with our own hormonal system are simply disruptive, and we're really not sure in what direction will be a problem for someone. You know, we all have vulnerabilities, and some people in a family might be vulnerable to diabetes. Others, maybe it's asthma. Another family might be osteoporosis. Another family might be prone to particular aspects of mental illness. Mm. However these things show up, there's something that I think that is strongly happening environmentally, and I do feel that it's international. You know, the chemicals that come out of a plant, let's say in Beijing, can wind up over here in Northern California. For instance, near to where I'm at here in Marin County, there's times where they have been able to track the air signals from, or the, excuse me, the uh, air traces of chemicals from factories in China to Mount Tam in Mill Valley here in Marin County, just north of San Francisco in California. Uh, you know, I, as I read about these things, I, that just leaves my jaw on the table. I'm like, wow, you know, these ke the, uh, different factories have basically a, a fingerprint, if you will, a chemical fingerprint, and you can track where the chemicals actually go around the world. And the fact that we can do with that kind of precision is great and it's concerning because it turns out we're all on this together. We're all on the same planet. And so people have this idea that, oh, this only affects those people and not these people. That's a silly idea. This is an international issue. Oh, yes, absolutely. I had on the show Dr. Stephanie Seneff, um, who is a whistleblower around glyphosate and how glyphosate, which is uh, for listeners who haven't heard the interview, and it's uh, interview uh, number 89, Glyphosate is Roundup, is uh, Monsanto's Roundup, and uh, is sprayed on more and more crops. First, it was just the Roundup Ready crops, but now they're actually using it in other crops as well. Uh, and it is now being found not only in those foods. You go, oh, well, I don't eat GMO, so I don't get glyphosate in my diet. Wrong. Um, it's being fed to your meat. It's being fed to your 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 cattle. <laughs> it's, yep. it's being uh, – it's now found – uh, and and, and Ste Dr. Stephanie Seneff um, and her colleagues have have found that glyphosate is now in the MMR vaccine, and they they believe it is th that link um, because as a, a young uh, child, very uh, infants uh, uh, haven't fully developed the blood brain barrier, and basically they're injecting glyphosate that goes directly into the brain, which glyphosate carries heavy metals and 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 lets them go uh, in certain parts of the body. And she explained that, and it just blew my mind wow. that we are we are just giving Monsanto, which Monsanto created uh, weapons for wartime. They created uh, you know Agent Orange and horrific horrific um chemicals and then and then all of a sudden they became this um agricultural company and here here we're here to help you with all these you know healthy chemicals we're going to be spraying on your food and introducing to your bodies and your infants and now we're finding we're just you know the, these these whistleblowers are coming out saying no this isn't good for us we need to we need to really start regulating this um but it isn't unfortunately the damage is already is already being done and it may take many years before we finally stop using glyphosate and then and then the like you said it's 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 now in our environment it's in our planet it's in our soil mm -hmm. and uh so that, that that is really concerning so we have basically we have environmental pollutants we have you know furniture in our in our uh like off gassing <laughs> there's you know if there's something that has flame retardants on it that th those are hormone disrupting or obesogenic uh, chemicals. Um, so if you're working in a brand new building and the paint is off gassing and the carpet's off gassing, um, <laughs> I know people who had, had developed strange illnesses that MDs couldn't figure out what drugs to give them for. for. And when they went to an ND, the ND uh, figured out that it was because they were being exposed to 
things in, in, in buildings, just in buildings or in homes. And so we have that side to it. Then, like you said, we have the, we're eating, we're eating food like substances. Now we're not eating food. No, no <laughs> one's eating vegetables anymore. And if they are, it's covered in chemicals. We have to eat organic and local. Um, and so we've got all these problems. Another thing, and, and um, you might, you might already uh, be planning to address this, but another thing is how, much agriculture has changed a hundred years ago and more than a hundred years ago we would um we would often ro uh, uh, rotate our crops we would add uh, ash to our our, our soil we take the ashes yeah. from our, our our fireplace and add them to the soil we would even if you look at 200 year old recipes it calls for pot ash is the white ash which is pure trace minerals in a colloidal form and we would add that to our food so people were getting were, were remineralizing their soil and consuming more trace minerals and there's a direct link between mineral deficiency and inability to regulate blood sugar. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. Our soils are depleted and so are we as a result. You know, we're at the top of that food chain. And so when we eat the vegetables, we eat the fruits, if we eat the grains and we eat the meats, uh, the shellfish, the seafoods, the fowl, you know, whatever we might be consuming, however we are choosing to eat, we're going to be where it all concentrates. And when we eat things that are depleted, that are deprived, and that are not full of the natural abundance and balance of nutrients, then we have to make up for that somehow. And from there, you know, I mean, really, if, if we had said 70 years, 100 years ago, we'd have today's problems, I'm quite sure our great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents would have just looked at us very strangely and said, what are you all doing? How can you call that progress, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if you'd said to your great-grandmother, or even to your grandfather, hey, I'm going to go get some grass-fed beef at the store. They would have just looked at you and said, child, what is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean grass-fed? Right? Because what the heck, what do cows eat but grass? Come on now, who doesn't know that, right? These days, the poor cows don't get to eat grass. And if you buy grass-fed beef to eat for yourself, you're definitely going to pay more for it than you will for those cows' beef who's life has been spent eating anything but grass mm -hmm. yeah they, do you know about the skittle scandal right yeah i mean it's, it's crazy times right now yeah, we're in for listeners who don't know um a few months ago there was a, a state trooper that came across i forget I, at the top of my head i forget what state it is but but one of the states came across uh the road was covered in red skittles and he traced it back and the skittles didn't have an s on it but he said it was definitely he took pictures and put it online you can you can google it and he traced it back to a farmer and basically what came about uh, to the public which is it, it, the public didn't really know about this is that it is common practice for food companies like like mars and you know skittles to sell so for example this entire batch you know tens of thousands of skittles didn't have an s on it because the there was a power outage in the factory and so they had to basically sell these unusable unusable they were still cons you, a human could consume them if they wanted to but they didn't have s's on them so they had to sell them so what they do is they sell them to uh this uh, agricultural part of the industry which puts it into feed for our cows and our pigs can you imagine and then and then what does that do to the the animal i mean it is completely <laughs> messing with you're giving you're giving red dye and it's terrible. msg it's just terrible and you know horrible and 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 we're giving it what is it um what's what's in skittles like um like obviously glyphosate because it's corn um corn based sugar and 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 so this poor cow is being fed basically junk food and then they they say they have the audacity to say well by the time we're done formulating it it's the same amount of carbs that you know a cow would get but i'm like yeah but do you if you feed would you feed your child broccoli or would you feed your child skittles it's the same amount of carbs like yeah, people aren't People aren't clear about that. You're absolutely right. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. They don't get that food quality matters. And my experience consistently with my patients, with myself and with my family is that if you eat quality food, you are far less likely to overeat. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people overeat and get into trouble with their blood sugar or their weight because they are desperate for nutrients and they're doing the best they can to try to meet the body's very real and based in health desire for more nutrients. But the problem is 
what they're eating can't provide that resource. Mm-hmm. And so it winds up they're constantly in a deficit. They, they never quite catch up. Mm-hmm. This is this is I, I forgot to share this with you. I, I, I think I don't think I have, but um, I've shared it on the show before. I had diabetes and oh, I didn't know that I, I reversed it using natural medicine and using Yay. you know, like naturopaths. Yay. Um, <laughs> but basically what it what it came down to was I had hanger. <laughs> I was hungry and angry all the time wow. um and i i my blood sugar was out of control and and it was i i often would cry to my husband i'd just break down in tears i remember several times when we'd be out for a drive we'd be going from point a to point b and i would say you have to pull over now i don't care where we have to go through a drive through i need to eat i just i i cannot go another minute without eating and then after i eat whatever it was it didn't matter i had to eat i would just be crying and i'd tell him i feel like i am a prisoner of my body Wow. And um, and I and I, I know because I knew at the time how to eat healthy, but I didn't know how to regulate my blood sugar. And so mm-hmm. I ended up not eating healthy most of the time because I would get struck every like 45 minutes with this must I- I- intense urgency to eat. And um, once I found tra- I, I introduced uh, several things to my diet, but I, you know, like a, like like a cut out gluten and, and cu- uh, other things that my body was reacting to, obviously eating more plant based or, or uh, you know, whole foods diet. But when I introduced trace minerals within five days of, mm-hmm. of taking trace minerals, I woke up full of energy, no mental fog, which was a big deal to me. And at 2 p.m., my husband turned to me and said, you haven't eaten all day. And I looked at him and I was completely clear minded. And I said, oh, my God. And I could not remember a time in my life, in my adult life, when I could go all day just and I was so happy and busy that I forgot to eat. <laughs> yes. And so for me, like that was, I mean, and it's not just one thing. It's not just, oh, just take a supplement. It's everything. Right. It's, it's, there's, you know, you got to go for walks and, you, you know, there's more, there's more you got to do. But for me, that trace mineral element was, I realized that not only was I having blood sugar issues, but like you said, the person is desperately, the body is desperately trying to secure nutrition and in doing so creates these cravings. And that's like pica or cribbing. The body is literally, tell it constantly creating hunger because you're eating food that is void of nutrition. Yes, you are absolutely right. No, I didn't know that about your background that you were able to beat back diabetes. So good for you. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. The last time I just got my blood work done a few months ago, my 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 ND was jumping up and down. I I think it was like the lowest I've ever had my um A one C, and it's been it's been wonderful. I'm you know I'm I'm very I feel very blessed. Um, it's health is a journey. You know, it's not yeah. like you know I still have stuff that I'm working on, uh, because it you know it's a journey. And, uh, but I love, I love learning from naturopaths and I love seeing the results. And I, and I love that today in this show, we can help so many people. So is there anything before we move on to the solution? Is there anything Mm -hmm. else you want to say about the problem to help people wrap their brain around from the naturopathic standpoint, the problem? Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure if this is as much of an international phenomenon as it, I'm certain it's a U.S. phenomenon. I just don't know how many other countries do things this way. One of the things I've observed with diabetes um, and blood sugar related issues is that sometimes it is a reflection of people's economic circumstances. So to say that more simply, this is a disease that often plagues people, not always, but often plagues people who are poor and who don't have a lot of money and may find themselves in a community where the cheapest calories by far are going to be the carbohydrate, the sugar industry calories, because those industries are subsidized. The corn industry is subsidized, i.e. it's given money by the government to raise food that it doesn't actually use to feed us. And those foodstuffs are used to be derived, d- derived rather into some kind of sugar. And so, you know, the starchy stuff, the Twinkies, et cetera, those kinds of things, then tend to be the the cheapest ways to eat food, fill up, and to stop feeling hungry. And for a lot of people, particularly people with families raising children or who are otherwise maybe find they don't have enough dollars to, to last a month, this is one way to try to address it. And in doing that, then, you know, the more expensive vegetables and the proteins and beans and um, to some degree, certainly seafood, depending on what you uh, purchase, can be more expensive as well. And so the cheapest things is going is to be those carbs and starches. And they're more filling, dollar for dollar, 
Um, they're also obviously full of carbohydrates of the simple kind, the kind we don't want, the, the straight to sugar, the straight to glucose kind, and or, you know, they hit the bloodstream and or fructose goes to the liver and then, you know, get, create a whole nother set of problems. And then people wonder why they're not well. Um, so just in terms of painting a picture around the problem, some of this has to do with the quality of food that people have access to as well. Definitely. Got it. So let's start talking about the solution. What can we do to shift this? What can we do to get our blood sugar back under control, help, help ourselves first and, and then, and then help our friends and family? Absolutely. So there's a few places you can choose to start. And I always encourage people to pick one, not to try to do everything at once. Otherwise they feel overwhelmed. And when we feel overwhelmed, we quit. We don't keep trying to do what we need to do. And so I always want people to feel empowered and to be able to make that positive momentum to happen, make those small incremental changes and shifts in their habits so they can be successful. So I say pick one of four flags. Either you're going to start with your nutrition habits, i.e. how you eat. You're going to start with exercise and movement. You know, you're going to take that on. Or you're going to look at your stress levels and figure out what you can do to positively relieve stress that doesn't involve uh, eating more sugary foods to relieve stress. And, you know, people don't understand that cortisol rises with stress and therefore that's why they want to eat the sugar. So there's no need to feel bad. This is a normal reaction, but your situation is abnormal. So that's what we have to shift, right? Or your fourth flag, it could be sleep. Some people have really crappy sleep and their sleep is disrupting their blood sugar. And if they don't solve their, their sleep problems, their blood sugar is not going to improve. And that's particularly true for people who might otherwise be doing a lot of smart, really good things. And they find that they still have an issue with their blood sugar. And nobody's asked them, let's say, about their stress or their sleep. So once we pick a flag, then from there, you figure out, okay, how am I going to make this better? So you can work. I work with people to identify what's wrong in that arena. So for some people, they're eating too much, and it's a lot of rich food, it's a lot of carbs. So that program for changing their nutritional habits is going to be different than the person who's got an out-of-control sweet tooth. That's a different conversation, right, with their body. The person who is always sedentary, they are always asking other people to get up and do stuff for them. Um, if they can find a way to not move, uh, that's them. That's their big thing. So we find ways to encourage and to get them in motion. Maybe have them tap back into that little boy or that little girl that maybe jumped rope or who liked to dance or whatever it was that was movement oriented and work it into their day. You know, have people do stuff while they wait in line, et cetera. So they don't necessarily have to carve out an hour to go to the gym because frankly, for some people that is just not gonna happen. We have to find a way to make their actual life more active. Maybe the issue is stress. In which case, identify where's the primary source of stress. Is it at work? Do you hate your job? Are your coworkers awful? Um, maybe it's family or personal things. Something's not right at home. What's the difficulty there? Maybe the stress for them is economic. Maybe they don't have enough money in order to meet their financial obligations, and that's a source of stress, et cetera. So once that gets figured out, then you know they can work on that. And they may find that as they are able to have success and drop that stress level, you know, reduce the pressure and the stress, then they don't have as many cravings. They don't feel as compelled to overeat or to eat sweets, etc. And for the people who don't sleep well, obviously that needs to be front and center because that's the one time your body repairs. It's clearly in restoration and rejuvenation mode. And if you don't sleep, your memory isn't right. Your short-term memory is impaired. All kinds of things don't happen in your body. Your gut doesn't renew itself, etc. And, you know, I personally believe that sleep time is when our, our souls and our spirits also renew, too. It's not just our physical selves. It's all of our selves, our spiritual layer, our mental layer, our physical layer, and the interactions between those realms. And that if you don't have good sleep, it means you aren't quite set up for your next day. And so from there, then, we can sort out, you know, what's going to be the right next steps, right? And that's part of what's driving me to create this online platform for people, because I think there's a way in which we can really get good work done and get it done inexpensively and effectively and a time frame that honors people's schedules. Because a lot of folks are just so very busy, it gets to be hard for them to make changes because they feel like they don't have enough time and space and focus for themselves. So I think that, you know, the online side can really be much more convenient and honor people's actual lives. I mean, now we can use that in a way so that when they need an idea, when they need a meal plan, they can go and look it up. 
if they need uh, the Facebook group, let's say, to be in for support in the community to say, oh, my gosh, what a day I had. I need an idea on how to handle this. Right. And people will know that from the context of how all these things affect their blood sugar, because it's the bullseye of the target. If we solve the blood sugar issues, if we solve the reasons why it's on a roller coaster, they're going to get better. So some of my favorite books, one is one that I wrote, of course, that's a favorite book for me. <laughs> it's called Heart Health for Black Women, A Natural Approach for Healing and Preventing Heart Disease, written by myself, Dr. Beverly Yates. And one of the reasons I wrote the book was because a publisher asked me to. It turned out in the 1990s that black women were having a much harder problem with cardiovascular disease. And in the 90s, we're the only American demographic for whom heart disease got significantly worse. Then in the 2000s, everybody caught up, unfortunately. <laughs> and it got worse for everybody. <laughs> but we were outliers in the 1990s. So that was the impetus for writing that particular book. Uh, I've certainly got some other books uh, on my mind, and we'll see what the uh, future brings for that. Um, I've also had a chance to be a co-author of a textbook, a medical textbook for nursing schools, and that was fun. And I wrote a little ebook on PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, Two new books that I've recently read and that I find really helpful. One is called The Secret Life of Fat, the science behind the body's least understood organ and what it means for you. And that'll be in the show notes. And I think that she did a great job of bringing together the current science around fat. And she talks some about the microbiome and other things that just matter a whole lot, blood sugar and hormones and you know, something that I learned from the book that I didn't know was that fat contains stem cells. That blew me away. I was like, what? So I was like, I just, I recommend it. I'm always about current science and for people who are evidence-based and research, bringing it forward and making it understandable. You, so I just want to assure people, you do not need a fancy, sciencey, technical kind of background. This is written for everyone to read and enjoy. Completely understandable. That is and, so fascinating. I can't wait to read that. The Secret Life of Fat by uh, Sylvia Tara. That, and absolutely the link for that will be in the show notes. That sounds fascinating. Yeah, yeah. This thing just came out and it's she, she's, she knows her stuff. She did a great job. So shout out to Dr. Tara. Good for you. And then another uh, book that I think people will help to just get a handle on shifting your personal behavior and really getting a look at making those small incremental shifts, you know, and building momentum, those wins, is called The Power of Habit, Why We Do What We Do in Life and Business, written by Charles Duhigg. And uh, I believe he's a New York Times bestseller. He has some other books as well. But I thought that the book on habit was a good way to just dive in there and get a more insight into why we do what we do? Like people try so hard sometimes to not do or to do things and just have so many struggles. What is that about? And just get some more insight. So you can have some more love, some more compassion for yourself. You know, we're not perfect. We are human and we make mistakes. But when you have a better under, uh, understanding of how we're wired and how our brains perceive reward, you'll have a much bigger success rate with making a change in your own habits because then you'll understand, oh, that's why I do this. This is what's going on. Or this is why it's so hard. Either way you want to look at that. I think I've read that book, uh, The Habit One. Um, did that... You know what? I heard him. That was it. I heard him episode, an early episode of the Tony Robbins podcast. It was like episode eight, I think. Uh, he was featured on it. And it was amazing. It just stuck in my mind. Um, and he talked about uh, very interesting uh, metaphors about habits. Um, I think he also talked about habit stacking, which I think is one of the most powerful things I've ever learned about habits. Habit stacking being if you want to implement a new habit, you pick a habit you already do. Like if you already, if you brew coffee every day, no matter what, if like you're on, you're tra on vacation, you're traveling, you're on business, whatever, seven days a week, if you get up in the morning, the first thing you do is brew coffee, then that is the habit that you want to then take a new habit. So let's say your new habit is um, 10 push-ups. Then you do 10 push-ups while like either before, during, or after you brew coffee, but it's so much easier to implement a new habit attached to an old habit. So if your habit is eating eating meals every day, then then adding leafy green vegetables will be easy because it's you don't need a reminder. It's like, okay, now I'm gonna eat. I already eat every day, so I just to add the leafy green vegetables to it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I love I love that. I think it's so important to understand how to what it's like we could tell people all the great things to eat 
and all the great activities and, and, you know, lifestyle things to do, like breathe, walk, meditate, go in the sunshine. But if there's no a structure for them to implement this new behavior in their life, it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. So that's absolutely right. Right. I love it. Now you have a free 30 day blood sugar challenge. Where can our listeners go to sign up for your wonderful free 30 day blood sugar challenge? If they go to my website, so that's www.dr Beverly Yates. So DR like the abbreviation for doctor and then Beverly Yates.com slash challenge. If they go there, we will have a sign up page up and we will direct them accordingly. And they can also hit me up on social media and we can direct them to the free 30 day blood sugar challenge. I think free is a fantastic price. We can give people <laughs> a great experience. That's just wonderful. a great experience. And it doesn't have to cost anything and we can get them started. And then from there, there'll be paid content on the membership site at a very affordable price. I'm not about turning this into a, you know, $50,000 a month sort of a program, hardly. <laughs> now, I love you on social media. I got to see a Facebook Live uh, video that you did um, <laughs> the other day, and I thought that was so cool. You're totally on Snapchat, uh, DR Beverly Show, Instagram, DR Beverly Show, and Twitter, DR Beverly Show. And then um, I'll just have the links to everything, your all of your uh, um, social media and the free 30-day uh, blood sugar challenge and your website and your book. I'll have links to all of that in the show notes of today's podcast. So That'd be great. So can uh, go to learntruehealth.com and find that in uh, the show notes. Um I'm, I'm so excited by everything that you're doing and I love that you um, lay it out so simply. And I love that you also don't want to over uh, give too much, give too much uh, for someone to do. Cause that can, um, that can uh, definitely overwhelm and then they're not willing to do anything. So, yeah. so I'm, I'm, I love that you lay it out. Uh, can you share, do you have any off the top of your head, stories of success that you would like to share? Obviously not not disclosing a patient's name, but do you have any stories of success that you could share with us? Sure, I sure do. I have two in particular, and I'm smiling right now as I say this because I'm thinking of these two women. They were just so amazing. One in particular, you know, she's like my A++++ student, right? And it's one of the reasons why I decided to use the um, handle on, on social media, including Facebook of Dr. Beverly Show, DR Beverly Show, because, you know, they had been so encouraging to me. They knew about the media work that I'd been doing. And I just thought, let me just honor that side of it. This can be good. It doesn't have to be like cheap or something that's like, you know, just so low level. You just don't even want to be associated with it. We can elevate what goes on when we do things on media. And so one woman, you know, she's a really interesting lady. She's a single woman. She, when she first came to see me was 10. Yeah, about 10, 11 years ago now. And at that moment, she was really at a crossroads in her life. She had been obese for just about all of her adult life. And she was feeling pretty hopeless that she would ever, ever solve it. She was insulin resistant and pre-diabetic, did not want to become a type 2 diabetic. And her whole family had problems with weight. And long story short, you know, she took it seriously. And you know the moment, actually, when it pivoted, when it changed for her? The moment when it shifted was when I just looked her straight in the eye and I said, do you want this to really be different? And she was ready for it. She was ready for it. I didn't smile. I didn't frown. And there was just no judgment. I was just there to be with her. But I wanted to know if she was real. Like, are you going to do this work or are you not? Because if you're going to do it, I'm with you. But if this isn't the right time for you or if I'm not the right person, hey, we're, it's, it's cool. Mm-hmm. You know, but this is serious. We're talking about your life. And I thought about a pair of shoes or whether or not you got applesauce at the store. We're talking about your life. Would you like your health to be better? And she did everything I asked her to do. And she had such sustained, um, maintained blood sugar and health results that just this past, the prior summer, she got skin surgery to replace, to, to get rid of the excess skin from the weight that she lost because she finally trusted that she had complete handle on the things she needed to do in her lifestyle so that the weight wouldn't come back. She's been just really steady. And I've been able to help her through that menopausal change where hormones can really undo a lot of people's best efforts around weight control, that's for sure. So that's one story that comes to mind. Awesome. 
the another story, a different one, an older woman. When I first met her, oh, let me think about this. I believe she was 61 or 62 and ornery as they come. <laughs> she absolutely was ready to send any doctor packing. In fact, she'd fired six. You know, I was number seven. And her daughter brought her in feeling really hopeless. Her daughter had called in advance of the appointment and had let me know that her mom could be a handful. I was like, okay, I'm going to have to need to be on top of my game today. So when we met, you know, she comes in and we sit down and we're talking and I look at her and I say, tell me about what's important in your life. And so she starts telling me about her business. You know, she owns a restaurant. She works there with her husband. And it was clear to me that a lot of their lifestyle and social stuff revolved around the restaurant. I was like, okay. But I'm realizing her daughter is worried sick about the mom. Now, at this point, the mom, who's actually a grandmother, has type 2 diabetes. She has a, a very unfriendly cholesterol profile. She has sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, severe. So at this point, this means her upper airway pretty much collapses readily when she tries to go to sleep. So that's not good. She's refusing to use a CPAP or any other kind of an airway positive pressure device to keep her airway open at night when she sleeps. So she's not sleeping. She's got heartburn along with GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And she's got, of course, with all of this, high blood pressure. Oh, my gosh. That's quite a list, right? Now, you know, naturopathic physicians, we see this kind of scenario a lot. You know, we see a lot of people with chronic kinds of illnesses. But when it gets to this level of complexity, I realize I have to find something that will get in her head in a good way. I need to get in between her ears with her, show her that I care. I have expertise and then help her with the situation. And if I can't make a believer of her, of her valuing herself enough to make these lifestyle changes, this will be a waste of time. I'll be doctor number seven and she'll be on to number eight. That's just how it's going to go. So I know that something hasn't connected for this woman. So as we go through the initial consultation, do physical exam and talking to her, then I come to find out. She had been diagnosed with uh, obstructive sleep apnea like 11, 12 years before. Wow. She had the CPAP and had refused to use it and wouldn't go back so they could try to find uh, a different settings, maybe a different face mask, whatever they might have needed to do to adjust and perhaps make this more comfortable. She wanted nothing to do with it. She was also eating right around 11.30 at night, midnight. So when the restaurant was closed, she'd sit down and have this big dinner with her husband. Now he's Mr. Skinny. She's the other side of it, right? She's morbidly obese. She's maybe five foot one. So she's a petite woman, short. She, she cannot afford to pack on the, the weight. This is not an Amazon build woman. This is a much smaller woman. And, you know, as I got to know her in the course of the hour, I said, you know, how many grandkids do you have? And she told me. I said, how old's the oldest one? And she told me. And I said, hmm, is anybody married yet? Well, she said, no. She said, but, you know, these two are looking pretty serious with, you know, their respective um, girlfriend, boyfriend, and I smiled and I thought to myself, aha, I gotcha. And I said, would you like to be able to watch them walk down the aisle? And I just got quiet. And she looked at me and her eyes started to tear up. And I said, okay. I said, this is what you care about. Mm -hmm. I said, if you want that to happen, if you want to be alive and well enough to be at these weddings for all these grandkids you've got, I said, you've got to make some changes now. You just do. Mm -hmm. And that's where it changed. Wow. How, did you find that she knew what to do? Uh, but she just... Some of it. She, she wasn't willing to do it and then she kicked in or, or was it... So some of it, she knew some of what to do and some most of it was, was you guiding her? Yeah, some of it, you know, she knew. And then some of it was new information for her and for her daughter who's just such a loving person to whom I just, you know, give a, obviously an anonymous, but a shout out to a thank you because it's wonderful when family members can come in because my experience clinically, and I know just about any doctor of any kind of doctor will tell you this, counselors will tell you this, you know, therapists, that people often don't listen to the folks who are closest to them, particularly their blood relatives, their family, and especially if they're, though, if they could have changed your diaper, they can't hear you. They don't listen to you. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> They don't, you know, it's not even personal. So with that in mind, that's why you take them to other people, right? <laughs> to tell them what you told them. <laughs> it's so true. That's it's funny. true. So, you know, I always keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, you know, you got to find that thing that's important to someone. What's the one thing that's going to move the needle here? Make the difference. Mm, I love it. I love it. it. But you know what? For me, sometimes I'm... Um, 
I have to think of my son and sometimes I have to think of my husband. I've lost both my parents. And so I just think, you know, do I want my husband or my son to not have me in their life? Yeah. And I'm sorry for I, your loss. Th thank yeah. you. And, and for me, it's a hard, I had a hard wake up call. I got to like throw the ice bucket, uh, the, uh, the bucket of ice water over my head metaphorically and go, wake up. Do I, you know, do, do I want to have a world in which my son doesn't have his mother uh, growing up or my husband, you know, doesn't have me to be there? And and that's sometimes the 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 hard reality I have to face when when making health decisions. It's like I don't feel like going for the walk, but I, I want a future in which my son when I, I can watch my son go down the aisle and I can watch his kids go down the aisle. So I'm going to go for that walk. You know, I don't, yeah. <laughs> I feel, you know, I feel like lasagna. I don't feel like uh, two cups of leafy greens, but you know, <laughs> what do I, what, you know, what kind of future do I want? And it's, it's that EQ, the emotional quotient, which is, um, do, do I want the instant gratification, the ple pleasure now pain later, or do I want the short, the, it's the sh short term gain, long term pain, or do I want the, the short term pain, like you said, the first few steps are the hardest, like like figuring out how to get vegetables into your meal and, you know, that kind of thing, one step at a time. And all of a sudden you realize now you're eating lots of vegetables and it's easy. And then you add the next thing and then that becomes easy. But the first few steps is the hardest. And I just have to keep asking myself, you know, do I do I really want this like like moment on the the lips forever on the hips kind of scenario <laughs> or you know or can I and often what I do a little trick is I just imagine what it tastes like I, I don't know if everyone else can do this but I can sit there I could eat an entire piece of chocolate cake in my head and and and, and feel the feelings of a chocolate cake and then go okay I don't need that because I just had it like I just I tasted it in my, cool. in my mind and I can cool. move on. I don't know if, if you've ever tried that, but taste it in your mind and move on and just go for the leafy green vegetables and enjoy them because what you want is 20 years from now to feel healthier than you are now and not be dead. So it's like that yeah. hard reality. Yeah. I love everything you're teaching and you're doing. Let's talk a bit about um, how people can work with you since you are uh, shifting into this um more online modality. You have a great book. Um, I'd love for you to talk about basically your website and, and how people can work with you and, and the things that you offer right now. Yeah. So right now, you know, my practice is in transition. I do see people by appointment only at a clinic in Corte Madeira, which is in Marin County, just north of San Francisco. Um, I will also be very active with this online business to get uh, this going and have the staff set up so that we can really respond and support and help people. And so the the bright line will obviously need to be on the online side because, you know, there's all these, these issues with practicing medicine across state lines. So I'm making sure that what I do online is about lifestyle things. So we can talk about nutrition and we can talk about stress and sleep and exercise and movement and thereby um, keep me out of the realm of uh, anyone trying to perceive me as being their doctor. Because I can say quite clearly and all of our disclosures will say, you know, that this does not constitute a doctor patient relationship because in today's world, you know, people sometimes We'll like to sue folks when it really doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And so we just have to be sure we keep that really crystal clear. Can we give you information and share things? You know, like in the membership site, there will be courses when people come to the membership site to welcome them. Then they can go and learn in much more detail things about nutrition and how it interacts with blood sugar and what works for people and what doesn't work and why. And I find that for a lot of people, once they know why something works or doesn't work, it really helps them to make the positive change. It just doesn't feel like they're being tortured for no reason. They get the, the reason why, right? Um, and we'll talk about exercise and movement and how that interacts with blood sugar in the membership site. There's also going to be the sections, the courses available for people on sleep for stress. And then of course, weight management, because weight loss and weight management is definitely an aspect that many diabetics and pre-diabetic folks struggle with. Um, and so just to help tease apart all of those things. And then once a month, perhaps twice a month, there'll be group calls and I'll be live on the call and people can come and they can ask questions. If they can't make the call, they can always send that in in advance. That's one of the joys of technology because people could be anywhere on the planet. So that might be the time that we're on live might not be the right time for someone who's, you know, 12, 16 hours away time zone wise, but they can still submit their questions in advance. And then there will be more things available as time goes by. Um, right now I'm developing meal plans um, that will make sense for people, again, with an international palette in mind, because the internet lets you have so much bigger of a reach than you would otherwise have. 
So, you know, some of the dishes might uh, be Thai food inspired. Some might be Mexican food inspired. Some might be Indian food inspired. Some might be more from the Southern cuisine of the U.S., etc. You know, so those different flavorful, really rich kinds of profiles that are satisfying, minus the elements that might be problematic for blood sugar control. Wonderful, wonderful, because I know people who, you know, from those Latin countries, and, and I know that that's a very, uh, blood sugar issues are, 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 are prevalent there as well, and uh, you wouldn't want to give them a recipe book that's more like, here's a, the American food, and yeah. they're used to eating their Latin meals, and so how, how can someone from Latin America uh, gain control of their blood sugar while not having to eat, like, Chinese food or eat? Japanese food, you know, it's like so, so it's a yeah. foreign concept to them. Uh, yeah. Saying, oh no, everyone has to eat like like macrobiotic. Let's all eat like a <laughs> Japanese person. You know, you won't you won't get a lot of people understanding how to go there. So it's it. I like that you're considering the different uh, cultures, and then maybe if someone who's uh, has diabetes in Japan goes, hey, I, I'm going to check out her recipes, um, Latin America recipes. That sounds like fun. So you guys, you can uh, take on the different uh, cultures. Yeah. Uh, which is also fun because now it's like, uh, you don't, mi they don't miss their, their mushy car carby food because they're used to um, their adult baby food, as you said, because now they're, they get to experience uh, a variety of uh, new flavors. And that that's fun, too. I like that. Very cool. Well, you know, everything Thing you're doing sounds like a lot of fun and again for the listeners show notes in the show notes of the podcast are going to be all the links to what dr beverly yates does so you will be able to go check out her membership and um her 30-day challenge it's really exciting i just I, I have such an appreciation for what you do and the difference that you're making in the world so thank you so much for everything i'd love for you to uh close out this interview sharing um what are some final words of wisdom you'd like to impart upon our listeners so uh there's two chunks to it one is you know uh, uh continuing on with the theme of, of diabetes around why diabetes and and you know how to really get a handle on it and the other one is to just talk about the uh, challenge as the way out because if they come and do the challenge they're going to get somewhere and we're trying to, to literally shift this. And you know how tough this is because you've lived it. So I so appreciate the fact that you invited me to be on your show because, you know, you get it at a much deeper level than the typical person interviewing. Trust me. <laughs> I live this stuff. Like, that's why I yeah. started this podcast is you get it. wanting to help others because I had nature Bathing medicine saved my life. And, wow. and I was like. This this is so ridiculous. I feel like I don't know if you ever heard Plato's Cave. Um, Plato uh, uh, had, I mean, you know, Plato, which is what, like twenty five hundred years ago. Um, yeah. I'm probably getting the, the it's 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 a long time ago. <laughs> Plato was around, but he, he has this beautiful story, which I highly recommend uh, reading. And that is that basically there's these people chained in a cave and they they've been there their entire life. They've never seen outside world. And the only thing they can see are shadows being cast by their captors. Um, so they they grow up believing that the world is 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 uh, one dimensional, um, that they all they can see are shadows and they don't they've never seen color and they've never seen texture or, or any dimensions at all and one day someone ex escapes from it and he crawls out of the cave to all of a sudden see this new world that's three-dimensional that has depth that has color and he runs back into the cave to help the other people uh he tries to tries to try to explain to them what he just saw and they end up killing him because, because he's he completely tried to change their world and they weren't ready for it and so mm -hmm. it's like it's like plato's cave it's like we're up against i it changed me and i want to turn around and help and help others but if they're not ready to come out of the cave right there mm -hmm. when you try to shift someone's mind and they're not ready for it they're going to ab react and that's um but if someone crawls out of the cave and all of a sudden they're googling health and they're looking in itunes and they see my podcast because it's been number one in health section uh for the last year now 
Uh, and and they, they 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 start to they've crawled out of the cave and now they're listening to this podcast and listening to others, and we can be that voice. Uh, they can join us outside of the cave and hopefully their friends and family they can help in a in a gentle way shift them. But sometimes there are people in our life who just aren't ready, and obviously they're not listening to this podcast because they're not even looking for yeah. this information. But more and more people are waking up, and we've got to help those people find a holistic medicine on a weekly basis i get emails from my listeners saying i never had heard of a nature path in my life i don't know what naturopathic medicine is and i found your podcast and now i'm seeing a nature path thank you yeah and that yeah. i mean i i am brought to tears on a regular basis because because <laughs> what i what i can do is i i can help uplift the naturopathic profession i'm i feel like i'm living my life's journey my life's mission because if i can lift up your profession we can help thousands and thousands of more people and make turn that ripple into a tidal wave so so i am i'm so happy and thrilled to be doing this and thank you listeners for being here with us on this journey please share this podcast with all your friends and family who have any kind of blood sugar issues let's help them awaken and come out of plato's cave and and begin to get their life back and and uh, take the steps that dr beverly yates has outlined for us uh join dr beverly yates uh, free 30 day blood sugar challenge and let's all get our health back together um I know that was my little tangent and you were wrapping it up and, and uh, you can continue. <laughs> Please continue. That was great. <laughs> From the heart, really clearly, yeah. you know. Um, I'm really passionate about blood sugar related issues real, for a simple reason, right? The impact it has on people is profound. And it's the one chronic illness that comes to my mind immediately, right? Just immediately for me. When I think of the saying, let your food be your medicine. Because it's just really true. It's the way out. And I also know that sometimes people have other uh, complications that make it so that they are in the world of diabetes and prediabetes. But I, I just know that we can move that rock and we can move it together. You know, like one saying I have is like, no prediabetes, no pre-D by the year 2033. Mm. Like what if we got everybody fired up and said, hey, we're gonna just solve this and turn the momentum around so that people are not showing up anywhere near as frequently with pre-diabetes and therefore type two diabetes eventually, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I could have just made that decision as a culture. We've solved smallpox, right? We made a huge difference. We got rid of polio. We cleaned up the water supply. What if we decided we could take this on as a community, as an international community around say pre-diabetes, the on-ramp to type two diabetes? Mm -hmm. I think we could do it, mm -hmm. but we all need to be savvy and we'll have to figure out how to be each other's allies and cooperate in ways that you know are not common, but I think could become common. And I don't think this is a wild dream on my part. I think it's possible. Whether it's nutrition prescriptions, you know, like you go and you get diagnosed with diabetes, type two diabetes or prediabetes, and you get a nutrition prescription, let's say, an exercise and movement prescription. How about that instead of just drugs? That would be pretty cool, right? Well, that would be uh, getting to the root cause. The root cause, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for folks, if you're fired up, if you're motivated, sign up for the free 30 day blood sugar challenge. Yeah, I'm going to walk you through it. It's easy to do. And the program focuses in on nutrition, of course, stress, removing stress, reducing stress, improving your sleep and using great tasting food with the meal plan to manage your blood sugar and help make improvements there where possible. And also exercise and movement, how to weave it into your actual day, not just your ideal day, but even the messed up day, because those happen. <laughs> Yes, if we so plan, absolutely. if we plan for the messed up days, then they're not going to trip us up. And I love that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Beverly Yates. It's been wonderful having you on the show, and you are welcome back anytime to come share about anything. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, this is just a, pre a pleasure for me. So I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm a fan. Take care. I love your work. Enjoy what you heard today on your episode of the Learn to Health podcast. Did something move you, inspire you? Did you get great information that's going to change your life? Awesome. That's exactly what I'm here to do is to help you gain your health back. Please turn around and share this. If this is something that's helped you in any way, share this with those you love. Love the Learn True Health podcast and want to support us? Awesome. You can go to TakeYourSupplements.com and you can support us that way. You'll get access to amazing supplements that are just really great quality for a great price. And there'll be someone on the other end of the line to help you pick out your supplements that are right for you. That's takeyoursupplements.com. 
or join our membership. LearnTrueHealth.com slash join. That's another great way to support our podcast, support our movement, and you'll be supporting yourself. Gain more information, wonderful videos, wonderful trainings, and you'll also be able to share those with those you love as well. So go to LearnTrueHealth.com slash join. Want something fun for free? Go to LearnTrueHealth.com and right there on the front page, you'll see where you can get our free cookbook. I spent a lot of time making it and it was so much fun. It's really delicious, healthy recipes. And you can also get our seven day doctor course uh, right there. It's seven days of naturopathic videos sent right to your inbox and you can learn from top naturopaths on how to gain health naturally. So that's TakeYourSupplements.com for wonderful supplements. LearnTrueHealth.com slash join to join our awesome membership, which is only open for a limited time. You can get our free healthy cookbook and you can also get for free seven days of wonderful naturopathic videos sent to you. Just go to LearnTrueHealth.com and you'll see it right there on the front page. Thank you so much for being a listener and thank you for sharing and helping others. Let's spread this information and turn this ripple into a tidal wave.